Chapter 9, The Great Unraveling. Roy nearly dropped with amazement at the sight that met his excited gaze. Beyond the door, the narrow passage expanded into a room of considerable size. An old wooden table stood in the middle of the floor, and beside it were two equally aged benches. In one corner, a small peat fire was smoldering in an open fireplace. On the opposite corner was a pile of blankets and rugs. Upon the table stood an oil lamp and some edibles. And upon the bench beside it, eagerly devouring the tasty food, sat, yes, Oscar and Bruce. Roy couldn't believe his eyes, but there were the two boys. Think what, what he would. Momentarily forgetting his eerie surroundings, he shouted, Hello, Oscar! The two boys jumped as though they had received an electric shock and fled for the door at the opposite end of the underground chamber. All they had heard was a muffled roar from the darkness, and terror seized them. Roy threw his weight against the old doorway, and it opened fortunately inward. Then he repeated his cry, adding, It's all right, only Roy Wallace, come back. The two returned, pale-faced and trembling, gazing in astonishment at their friend. How in the world did you get here, they gasped. And what in the world are you doing here, cried Roy. And that was about all they could say. Indeed, it took quite a while before the nerves of the three boys calmed down enough for them to talk sensibly again. However, going on with the interrupted meal, with Roy joining in, helped a lot. The food all put out of sight. The three drew the benches close to the peat fire and began to talk things over. So you've caught us at last, said Oscar, laughing. I thought you would some day. You seem so determined about it, but I never dreamed you would discover our hideout here. Well, it has been a job, replied Roy. You did well to cover up your traces so completely. I really had begun to think it was Rob Malcolm. It's funny you should have caught us this evening, said Bruce. If you hadn't, You might have never done so, for we had a letter today telling us that Father's coming home next week, and that, of course, we will put a stop to everything. Just in time, wasn't I? exclaimed Roy. I'm so glad for that. But say, however did you find this place? That was a great find, replied Oscar. We discovered it months ago and said nothing thinking we might have some fun out of it someday. We were playing about on the hills one day when Bruce happened to trip over something. He looked to see what it was and found a short length of iron sticking out of the ground, well covered with heather. He tried to pull it up, but couldn't. Then I went and helped him. Presently, after a great struggle, a small chunk of earth came up and on a hinged board and revealed an opening. We got candles and crawled in, and finally arrived here. No one would ever spot the entrance on the hills, for it's so well covered. But the other entrance, that I found, I asked Roy. Oh, that came as a matter of course. We went through the other door in this room and Follow the passage. We had a hard job opening the one into the cave proper and broke it a bit. I fixed it up as best I could and put the string through to make it easier to open from the other side. It was that frightened old Peter MacDonald. I was surprised to learn that the sound of our hammering had carried so far down the passages but old Peter's very quick of hearing. 
did you often go down to the main cave entrance? Asked Roy, keenly interested. Not very often. It's such a long way. We were there last night. Once, soon after you came, we caught sight of you, standing on a rock, looking straight at us. My, didn't we run? Yes, and what a job it was to look unconcerned when you came to our house soon after and found us pelting that bottle. But now, interrupted Roy, his enthusiasm rising as one after another of his problems was solved. What I want to know is, were you two behind all the village mysteries of the past few weeks? Now, you want to know something, don't you? laughed Oscar. Well, Bruce, I suppose we'd better tell him, eh? Bruce nodded. Seeing you have caught us almost red-handed, continued Oscar, I suppose we must confess. Yes, we were. And we were so glad to see that you suspected Rob, because we knew you would never catch us as long as you were after him. Tell me more, urged Roy. Did you have anything to do with the boat that everyone thought was stolen? How did the horse get into its stable and the widow get her groceries? How did the cork jacket and old Sandy's oar return? Oh, yes, then there's Peter MacDonald's supper, Mrs. McKay's Pete's, old Corky's boat, Jimmy's chair, Dr. McGregor's window, the old Kirk bell, uncle's penknife, Mrs. McIntyre's table. Yes, and the clock, and the cow, and all the rest of the happenings. Tell me all about them, do. My, you want to keep us here till midnight, exclaimed Oscar. It was all very simple. You, you see, no one thought of suspecting us, not even you. With father and mother away, everyone expected we would surely go to bed early and bolt and bar the door for fear of boogies. But we didn't. Sometimes we slept at home, sometimes here, as you see by the blankets. You remember my careful answer when you asked where we slept. Yes, I remember now, you replied. We sleep like tops. Yes, I was always careful never to tell an untruth, even to keep up the fun. Well, sometimes we slept at night, but usually we didn't, making up for it some other time in here. Then when we thought everyone was asleep, we started to work. Kindly Providence helped us to find a number of things it had been lost, although it meant hours of searching in some cases. The boat that everyone thought was stolen must have washed away in the storm. We chanced to find it on one of our expeditions up the coast. It had been dashed against a rock and had a hole at its side. We managed to pull it up the shore high enough to get at the hole, which we soon mended. Then we bailed it out and brought it home, in the dark, of course. As for the horse, we happened to beat it on a trip over the mountains. It wasn't very hard then to get it into the stable, except that it neighed so much we thought it would surely be caught. The cork jacket and the oar we found some distance down the coast while on a fishing trip. It was great fun pushing the oar through old Sandy's window, but I didn't know till afterward that it fell on his chest. Now, Miss McKay's Pete, of course we were the ones who put it behind her back wall at night, never thinking that she would see it. And then you came and wanted us to search. How we laughed about that. How about the boats? that got tarred, asked Roy. That was my idea, said Bruce. I saw you and old Corky start work on it, and then how ill he became. So I told Oscar, we soon finished the job. Then there was a the clock. I took that. 
we brought it here and mended it. The spring was gone, but we took another one out of a broken old clock we had at home. Did you lose the old clock spring, asked Roy. Yes, why? Here it is, said Roy, bringing it triumphantly out of his pocket. Found it on the hill, not far from your secret opening, I suppose. If only I had looked closer. If only, laughed Brutus. Dr. McGregor's window was next. Well, do explain that, said Roy. However, did you know the window was broken? Oscar happened to pass the Mansi just after the tree had fallen. He saw the branch had gone through the window and remembered that we had a piece of glass that exact size in our workshop. They're all standard, you know, so we made up our minds to put it in. Easy as a wink. But as for the bell, that was a job. We both climbed up into the bell free in the dark and took a good look at the works with our flashlight. Then we saw what was the matter. Somehow the rope got caught in something, and when we got it loose, the bell worked fine. Of course, we couldn't resist pulling it a few times just for fun. I heard it, said Roy. Woke me up and everybody else, too. That was the time I saw your footsteps. Did you really? asked Oscar. Yes, said Roy, but I wasn't able to follow them very far. They vanished in a big puddle. Ha ha, laughed Bruce. We went through that puddle on purpose to hide our tracks. But now we must tell you about Jimmy's chair. That was Oscar's work. He's quite a carpenter, you know. You remember, I told you that Rob Malcolm's father was a carpenter. So he is. That was to put you off the scent. Rob himself couldn't drive a nail straight. Don't know about my being a carpenter, said Oscar. But perhaps I didn't make such a bad job of it. The best thing, though, was Mrs. McIntyre's table. That was really great, especially when you chased us. How glad we were when our heather-covered doorway closed over us. Why didn't you finish the job the first night? Hadn't a, asked Roy. Hadn't enough screws, replied Oscar. Just what I thought, exclaimed Roy. The cow is the next important item, I suppose, continued Oscar. Nothing to that, of course. We just went and milked her for the poor old soul, only watching we did it when no one was about. Well, said Roy, when all his mysteries had been unraveled, you certainly had have had a most interesting time of it. But say, whatever made you do it? I wondered if you would ask that, replied Oscar. Several reasons. We wanted to make use of our secret chamber in some way or, or other, romantic if possible. Then, too, we wanted to make the best use of the time we knew we would have to ourselves while father and mother were away. We talked it over and hit on this plan of helping the sick and poor of the village as much as we could. We thought it would be a fine thing to bring a little sunshine into the lives of some of the old folks before they leave us. You know, in as much. That was it, said Bruce. We thought we would like to put into practice what Jesus said his people should do. Feed the hungry, help the poor, cheer the sad. We remembered his beautiful words. Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Yet we wanted to do it without having to go through the agony of being thanked all the time. That's tough to take, you know. You're right, it is, said Roy. But I'm sure you would be thanked if the village folks ever find, found out that you two were back of all these kind deeds. Most of them think angels are responsible for them all. Hardly angels, 
said Oscar with a laugh. As to the thanks, they don't matter a bit. We're only too pleased our plan has has succeeded in making some of the needy ones so happy. I suppose now that Father is coming back, we shan't have a chance to keep this up. At least not in the same exciting way. But anyhow, these last few weeks have been the happiest we've ever enjoyed in our lives. So the three boys talked on till the fire went out and the lamp burned dim, going over and over their recent adventures. Two of them happy that their efforts to cheer others and brighten lonely lives had been appreciated. In the third, rejoicing that at last he had solved the secret of the cave.